Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today for the Talks at Google series, we have with us Lauren Mayberry, the lead singer of the band Churches, as well as the rest of the band who will be playing a musical set at the end. Uh, coming onto the scene. Coming onto the scene two years ago with their song Lies, their subsequent single, The Mother We Share, as well as their debut album, The Bones of What You Believe, helped propel churches to the top five of BBC Sound of 2013, an award-winning appearance at South by Southwest, and a worldwide tour. Please join me in welcoming churches. Now, uh, most recently, I think a lot of the audience was expecting to see you guys at Outside Lands, but uh, I hear there was a little don't issue. Don't bring it up. Don't bring it up. No? Okay. No. We're still quite sad about it, to be honest. From what I heard, it was the airport's fault, so. Yeah, it was a catalog of disasters within an airport. Um, and then there was quite an upsetting bit where me and Martin got on the plane and could see everybody else at the gate, but they wouldn't let them on the plane even though we could see them at the window. And then we sat on the runway for 45 minutes while they offloaded all their bags, but they weren't allowed in the... It was very upsetting. <laughs> but it's okay. We're going to try and um, get a show in San Francisco. So at the start of the next year, but shh, don't tell anyone. We haven't figured out exactly when yet, but shh. Well, I think we're all looking forward to it then. Yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> we don't know when. It might happen. We hope it'll happen. <laughs> All right, so a year ago, you wrote an article for The Guardian about the perils of being a front woman in a band in the social media age. Now, as a band born on the internet, I take it that social media and be able to communicate with your fans is incredibly important to you guys. But at the same time, this also opened up some avenues for you know, abusive comments well beyond just normal musical criticism. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you guys use social media to interact with fans and the uh, experiences that led you to write the article for The Guardian? Yeah, well, I guess for us, we came about um, getting signed in a kind of reasonably unorthodox way. We didn't go about the traditional kind of uh, tour tour the UK for however many years and then tour Europe and so on. We came to a lot of people's attention because of online streaming and blogs and um people just passing the songs to each other on social networks. So um, we operated unsigned for quite a long time, and it was just important for us to use those things as a medium to communicate with people, give them information. And um, I kind of grew up in the MSN era of being on like band message boards and, and street teams and things like that. So from my point of view, social networks for us are kind of like online street teams, I guess. Um, and there's been definitely overwhelmingly positive parts of that for us but um because we oversee that ourselves i suppose when you're logging in to do all the do all those things sometimes you get a little uh, rape threat over your breakfast and that's fine <laughs> but um well it's not fine i guess is the point so um we just kind of posted the screen grab of like an example that we got sent um and it wasn't even some anything terribly terribly offensive and i was like this is just generally the tone of some of the stuff please stop um, and then The Guardian gave us the opportunity to expand on it a bit. Um, and I think the response was generally positive to us from people in bands or uh, people we meet at shows. But um, I don't know if it changed the world in any revolutionary way, but I guess uh, speaking about it is probably quite helpful. And then figuring out that other people actually agree with you and the world isn't actually just full of horrible, abusive internet trolls. It's good to, it's good to know. <laughs> So YouTube just recently changed its policy on allowing anonymous names for uh, leaving comments. You can now leave in a comment anonymously. And I want to know your opinion on whether, you know, that will affect any, do you think that'll affect anything? Or is this something that's going to happen regardless of if uh, people's names are associated with their messages? So they can now leave them? No, they can, they can leave ones anonymously. Oh. I have never actually left a comment on YouTube in my life ever, so I'm like, oh, that'd be a weird thing to do. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I was thinking about this earlier, and it's about, like, I think for me, I was like, it's about personal responsibility, and then who's responsible for that if people are posting abusive things? Who, who's the fall guy for that? Is that the social networks, or is it the person, or, like, should, like, law enforcement be talking about that? That who is responsible? Um, and I think where people are allowed to be anonymous kind of means that they feel like there's less of a fallout or something. And I feel like to an extent, 
when people are on the internet, no offense, because I know you guys are the internet, um, <laughs> they kind of, there's a certain level of where you're removed from that, so maybe you don't feel as much personal responsibility or something, I'm not sure. I'm worried about that. Okay. Uh, you also talk about one of the, this problem stemming from kind of a lack of empathy on the, uh, on the side of the people who are leaving the comments. Um, you know, here at Google, we have a very global reach, uh, and I was wondering if there's any suggestions you have for either Google or really the industry in general about how to kind of promote a sense of empathy in our, in our applications. And, you know, we're really changing the way that people interact, bringing it all online, and, you know, it would be great to kind of bring that sense of well-being that we have in real life online. Yeah, I guess... Anything like that is probably helpful, I think, trying to change the tone of conversations. But I guess in my mind, it's an, more the stuff that we've received is just a more exaggerated version of what happens in real life. So it's a kind of chicken and egg thing for me. Does that reflect society or does society reflect? Well, it's kind of hard to tell which, but um, I don't think that threatening and abusive content exists only online. People probably wouldn't say as much of that right to your face, but then there's a reason like why people think it's okay to say those things because there's a certain thread throughout society that makes people think that's fine. Like it's not like the only time I've ever had anybody say anything offensive or sexist to me is in this band on the internet. That happens to people all the time. I um, was coming out of a subway in Glasgow and somebody, it was like the last subway at night and someone uh, showed, showed me his penis and said, do you think you're too good for it, darling? Which is funny now, maybe. But at the time I was like, mm, I was like 21 coming home from work and I was like, it's not funny when you're there on the receiving end of that, so to speak. Um, so, I don't, and what do you say? I was like, I can't, like, I have no, I'm like five foot two, it was like 11.30 at night, he's a massive guy and had two other mates with him, what am I supposed to do about that? So, um, yeah, maybe he goes around leaving horrible comments on the internet, I don't know. Or maybe he's busy doing it in real life, it's hard to say. Um, it seemed like, so for, obviously you chose to, to speak up, uh, Part of the article is that you're not just going to, quote unquote, deal with it, uh, as a lot of people told you to do when you wrote the article originally. Uh, what, what side of the problem do you think stems from, from, say, other female celebrities or other women in general just kind of dealing with it? Because um, I feel like people wouldn't tell you to do that if it wasn't the majority of the people who were just kind of uh, dealing with it, uh, so to speak, and what problems stem from that? Well, I guess... Um the thing that was confusing for me was that, like most people were supportive of what we were saying, but there was a definite strain in the conversation where people were saying, like the onus is on the onus is on us to accept it and deal with it and things like that. And that to me is just like a fallout from a victim blaming culture where people are like, well, it's up to you to deal with it. It's not up to those people to not behave like that. It's up to you to suck it up and deal with it. And I guess the thing that I was finding, I was like, it's bad. It's awful if that's happening to you when you're using the internet in a personal capacity because everyone has the right to use the internet to seek out knowledge and, you know, do nice stuff on the internet. But um, I was like, this is something we're doing in the course of our employment. So if I want to be in a band and have a social network, then I need to accept that. And I think that's a quite pretty confusing way to look at it. Um, and also, I suppose probably a lot of people don't want to talk about that because I think it paints you in a certain light or something like that but I guess for me it was like these are things that we think personally anyway and it's something you're coming up against in your day-to-day -day job and in your day-to-day -day life so I don't really see why you should have to sacrifice doing things that you would normally do in order to appease what I hope is a minority of people. And so uh, at least in terms of the Google properties we can detect and delete comments that would probably be considered abusive pretty easily um, but at the same time, was that obviously you wouldn't see them then, and that would give you some sense of relief? But is there? Do you think it's only going to encourage the problem if people feel like they can leave these comments and that they're actually going to be deleted before they show up, so that you know, kind of generates anger on on and and you know, mean harboring feelings towards you, you know, on on the side of the commenters? Do you think deleting these comments would help fix the problem, or is it? Um. I don't, I don't know. Like, um, I thought about it a lot when we were trying to figure out how to deal with it. And so I was like, yes, it does make me feel better if I don't see any of these things. But then I was like, the option then in order to not see those things is to not partake in that part of the job and not do that. And I guess it always kind of uh, 
gets gets my back up quite a lot when people bring up the freedom of speech thing. I'm like, well, freedom of hateful speech is that is that allowed? And then I think there is a freedom of speech issue, but I don't, from my point of view, it's not the commenter's freedom of speech. It's our freedom of speech to go about doing what we're doing. And in order to do that, then you have to accept someone talking to you like that. So I don't. Um, yeah, whenever people bring up the, yeah, but I can say what I want because it's a free world and I'm on the internet. I'm like, mm, but you should, you're free to say what you want but not be a prick. I don't, <laughs> I feel like that should be like, you need to write that into like the European Convention on Human Rights or something. Freedom of speech brackets but not if you're a prick. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. I guess you can't, how, how do you change it? And I think it's great that, you know, companies like yourselves are trying to make a statement on something like that, but... I feel like there's probably quite a long way to go before it trickles down into actual day-to-day -day attitudes. You talked about some of the, uh, like the story you had of experiencing this in real life as well. Would you consider kind of these abusive comments online an evolution of, of catcalling or you know, other kind of street harassment, uh, or is this kind of its own separate thing? I think it probably evolves from the same, the same beginning point. That didn't make no sense in sense. It comes from the same starting point, I think, the same kind of attitude, um, that if, if a woman is in the public place, then she's op automatically opening herself up to these things. But I guess the distance um, created between people on the internet helps people maybe... I've never had anyone say to my face, you think this is rape culture, you won't know this until I come around and rape you, but they do that on the internet. If someone said that to me in real life, I would be very alarmed, and you would obviously report them to the police. But if it's on the internet, then people are like, oh, it's, you know, it's just the internet, it's just harmless, it's fine. And you're like, mm, mm, is it? <laughs> um, so either kind of before you wrote the article or afterwards, did you have any mentors either in the industry or in your life that had previous experience with something like this and were able to help walk you through it? Or is, it, is that something that you think maybe the music industry or, or th things in general need to have accessible? Um, I guess I didn't really have, um, didn't really speak to anybody about it in that way. I guess there's always people I've admired in terms of musicians and how they conduct themselves professionally and things like that. But um, I guess it would have been good if there was like a kind of how-to guide about that you could be like what was the threat I got today okay we'll scroll to that page and then oh right okay just ignore it okay um but yeah I don't know and I guess that's probably why it was um it was so confusing I suppose because although we're really supportive of each other I am the only woman in this band and I've always been in bands with very supportive guys but I've always been the only female in those bands so although people can empathize with you I guess it's not as threatening because it's not directed at them um so I don't know, I guess, I'm not sure, like women experience that on some level at, at some point in their lives, definitely. So I guess maybe you learned from the textbook of life or something, I'm not sure. Have you found that these problems have stemmed more from any specific social networks in general or is it kind of a broad thing that you've experienced everywhere? Like, is it harder to be a prick in 140 characters on Twitter? <laughs> Um, sometimes they're quite inventive, I suppose, but we generally, um, we've mostly, ha I would say the worst one is Facebook, I think, which is strange to me because there's technically more anonymity on Twitter because you don't need to use your real name. If your account gets deleted, you can make another one, like, however many hours later, whereas I suppose with Facebook, they want you to use your real name. If you do, I don't know. Um, um, but yeah, that's definitely where most of the the comments were coming in, and also because we still had, at that point, the direct message function on, which um, I think that's in another further removal for those people. So they're like, we are con contacting you on the internet, and it can't be seen by other people, so I can say directly to you whatever I wish to say. Obviously, we figured out how to turn that off now, <laughs> so that's much better. But, um, yeah, even now, if you post, like, I think I reshared an article that was... Um, on M Mike website and it was about uh, an advert in Sound on Sound that was advertising microphones and it was like um, a naked woman like from the side with her, like you could see her ass and stuff in it and uh, to me I was like, that's not, what's that got to do with advertising microphones? But it was a really interesting article that the guy who used to run Drowned in Sound wrote and then underneath it people were just like, shut up and go back to doing what you're supposed to be doing. Like, I don't want to read this, I want to come here and listen to music, I don't want, why are you talking about this shit, it's not relevant. And I was like, that article's about music, I think that is relevant. 
but just like seeing it all kind of unfold again, you're like, oh, there they go. That's fine. <laughs> but it's quite, I guess, the good thing for us now is that if people know where we stand on it, they kind of self-police a little bit more. So rather than us having to go in and be like, ugh, ban user, oh dear, and go through, um, people kind of have a more of a discussion about it. So I guess that's positive. But I don't really know how much that actually changes people's minds about things. So do you do you ever respond directly to these comments? Maybe in the beginning when you were when you first started receiving them, or do you generally just try to steer clear? Basically, any advice you'd have for for people who receive these sort of things? I think it's a difficult line to tread because my instinct tells me that every time somebody says that, then if you are threatened, then you need to go in on the offensive and just call people out on it. But I suppose. Um, got quite a busy day most days and I don't like <laughs> have a huge amount of time to troll through and be like oh great that's happened I'll spawn now be like what would your mother say things like that but um yeah I don't know I guess it's just trying to gauge it on a day-to-day -day basis and I think it was before we made any comment on it it was taking quite a, a personal toll to constantly be the person that has to be like no stop it no stop it or just so I've got to point out I'm just going to delete the people delete the comments and ban ban the users but can't ban people from life so that's a problem. <laughs> that sounds really like totalitarian. I'm like, get them all and put them in a bin, but I don't mean that. Uh, in the article, you tread pretty lightly around the word feminist. You uh, kind of treat it as if maybe, you know, there is some connotations that you don't want to associate with yourself. Um, you make comment that you don't hate men in general, that you're speaking, you know, feminism in terms of equality for the sexes. Um, do you think that the the term in general has kind of become unfriendly and um well, I think the start of the sentence says, "I am a feminist because I am, and I feel like all the caveats I put in after that were to counter what people say to you when you say that they're like, "Oh, so you hate men then oh well, all these other things and you're like, no, I don't that's just a stereotype that has been made to discredit what people are saying about it I think um so I have no problem identifying as that because to me it means somebody who seeks equality between all people. It's not about making women better than men. It's not about, um, you know, like a white middle class woman's agenda. It shouldn't be about that. It should be about generally society being a bit less shit sometimes, I think. Um, and I think there's loads of great examples of people who are making something like that more accessible to people. Because I guess for me, I learned about it through through music. And then I kind of figured out what those people were reading and who they were influenced by and that's how I got into like feminist literature and stuff but if you it can feel really kind of like academic and strange in that regard so I think the internet has been really helpful for that like things like feminist thing and Jezebel and stuff making it more um not even necessarily pop culture based but just more conversation conversational and um like hopefully more representative of more people because it's about your everyday issues so it shouldn't just be like in a book in a library somewhere in the uh, kind of what prompted me to reach out to you guys in the first place was uh, an article I read in the January issue of Pacific Standard. Uh, it's about a writer, Amanda Hess, who kind of covers her experiences with these uh, sort of comments. Um, she kind of talks about how she, you know, she receives these comments where people are threatening to come to her house. Uh, which, you know, if happened in a real life experience, if you went to the police with that, they would, uh, you know, get a restraining order, they'd take some sort of action. But because she received these comments uh, on the internet, the police kind of brushed it off. Um, they acted as if it wasn't important. They told her to get back in touch with them if someone actually shows up, um, which seems like there's a lot of room for something bad to happen there. Do you think as we, as we transition to more digital interactions that we that we risk kind of losing some of the standards and etiquette that we've kind of built up over the years and that you know, some of the safety might disappear as these things go online? I, I don't know. I guess that as the technology develops and society changes, then laws need to adapt to cater for that. Um, but I suppose right now it is a pretty big gray area because if they're like, they're like no physical threat has happened upon you then what can the police really do about it but then I just think it adds to the people feeling more alone and more vulnerable and more isolated um, and I suppose um, the thing with, with that is even if like I guess Amanda Hess you can find her online she's pretty well known but 
even if it was like a conventional stalking thing, the victim still doesn't have, I think that's what she says in the piece, like the victim doesn't have the anonymity of the person that's abusing them. Like, because they are the known person, whether they're a well-known person or just, you know, you don't have to be a journalist or in a band or whatever to encounter that kind of stuff. So I guess something something needs to be done to figure out what to do about that, but who knows what it is, I don't. Well, we'll uh, try to figure that out. Yeah, please, you guys are in charge of the internet, so <laughs> go fix. I'd Thanks. like to open the uh, questions up to the audience. Uh, there's a microphone back there. Uh, hello. Um, I feel like we've spoken a lot about policing and things, but even with police, bad things still happen, right? Um, you know, bullying in playgrounds, for example, is physical abuse, right? And we can police it as much as we can, but the bullies don't stop. Um, under the assumption that, you know, not an assumption, but this is emotional abuse, right? You're being emotionally abused. Um, this sort of parallel would be a bodyguard, right? A physical bodyguard is a celebrity, is a well-known person. You have a bodyguard who protects you as you move around the physical world. Um, do you think an emotional bodyguard um, for you on the internet is a reasonable response? Um, I think that if it existed, that would be nice, but it's pretty uh, abstract. But um, I don't know, I guess that's the kind of, th you have to kind of do that job yourself. And I think it's like separating the personal anguish, that sounds really pathetic, but anguish, uh, from um, from the prof professional side. Um, so trying not to make a knee-jerk emotional response to something and then just do the kind of, okay, block user, like go through that process. But um, yeah, I suppose it's more difficult to deal with because it's not like a tangible physical thing. There's no way of kind of like just putting somebody bigger in the middle because there really isn't that. Hmm. Okay, thank you. That's a hard question. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. Hi, so I just want to maybe switch gears a little bit, but I had a question for you guys. You mentioned at the beginning um, how your band started, start, like sort of started off with the music blogs and social media kind of spreading your name and even your, the way you spell it, you did it specifically so that you can, you know, kind of stand out on, on the internet. Um, how do you sort of see the music industry and bands that you see coming up, um, you know, that are just starting out, you know, utilizing these blogs and social media and the internet um, more so now, maybe in the past. And do you see um, that sort of increasing, you know, given given the rise of how many people are kind of plugged in um, in the digital age uh, nowadays? But is that something that you guys kind of support and and promote, or is it more so kind of band by band and and however they you know want to want to spread their name? I'm. I think for me, I guess as a case by case basis, and w the blueprint that works for one person won't work for somebody else. Um, and I think certainly for me, well, I remember being in bands like pre pre having a MySpace. That was quite interesting when you didn't have to like put your posters on MySpace or anything like that. Um, and I guess you just promoted it in different ways. Um, but I suppose now it's kind of unorthodox if a band doesn't have a Facebook page and things like that. And I think those things were definitely important tools for us to communicate with people but I've always been the person in the band that runs social networks for bands when I've been in them and I tried just as hard at the social networks for my other bands but they didn't uh, I guess they didn't connect with people in that same way so I like to believe it's about the content as well as the way that we pitched it but I think um, generally speaking the music industry is probably having to adapt a lot to incorporate all these new technologies and I think for a long time people were just trying to stand like the like little Dutch boy with his finger in the dam being, I don't know if that metaphor makes sense here. Um, but um, yeah, and then just kind of saying no to the progress because it was changing the way the industry worked. But I feel like you can't stop that process. It's just gonna happen. So the way that labels and things operate and the, the way that I, even radio and things like that will have to change because the, you can't stop, can't stop the internet and it's too late. So, and you know, there's, like a lot of good things have come out of that. Like without the internet, we wouldn't have been able to cover as much ground as quickly as we have. And it makes it, I think it makes it a lot more democratic in some ways, because if you have a certain amount of technology, you can make things at home in your bedroom and share them online. And you don't necessarily have to go through that filter of you know, getting the guy in the suit to listen to it and sign off on it before you can release it, because you can self-release on the internet. And that's pretty powerful. Thanks. These are hard. I don't. I, I looked at the sheet earlier and I was like, yeah, that's fine. 
and this is coming from left field, I don't know. I have a few questions from some of the people streaming this as well. Uh, what are the most effective actions you've seen men take to combat misogyny online? Um, I think that's an interesting one because um, when men speak to other men about it, I think sometimes I've seen that be a lot more effective because when I talk about it, people could be like, oh, well, she's saying that because she's a woman and because she's a feminist and blah, 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 and it's personal to her. And I don't agree with that argument, but it's easier to discredit me that way than it is to a man who's saying that to you. And I think... For me, like, um, I've gone to meetings of, like, feminist groups in Glasgow and then be like, mm, not for me, because one of the conversations was, it was like a feminist book group at university, and one of the conversations was whether we could read books that were written about feminism by men. And to me, I was like, that's com completely backwards. I don't want to sit here and be a part of that conversation, because it's not a conversation to be had in a room full of people who already agree. It should be a conversation that everyone's having. So, yeah, I think if everybody can be involved in trying to make society a tiny, tiny bit less rubbish sometimes, then that would be good. This is from Eric. Would you use something like a spam filter that automatically labeled aggressive emails? And uh, more generally, what do you think about the role of technology in reducing online misogyny? Um, I guess a spam filter is probably useful insofar as then you wouldn't see as much of it, but it doesn't necessarily deal with the root problem because then it's, I guess it's a way of you dealing with it rather than going to where it originated and trying to stop it happening in the first place. Um, I guess, I don't, I don't know, like, I think for me, technology is really has been really useful because we traveled so much and it enables me to keep in touch with people and work on the move. And in the same way that it does for everybody, you can, you know, just simple tiny things that make the day easier and better and um, I think that's a really powerful thing and I don't want to make it sound like I'm poo-pooing the internet or anything because I'm definitely not but um, yeah I think I guess I don't know about technology necessarily but kind of what we were talking about the internet has definitely opened up a conversation about feminism and misogyny yes it's probably spiked it a little bit as well but um, if people are talking about it in the same forum then that's probably a good thing I feel like you should grade all my answers or something. I don't know. Uh, we have a music one as well. Uh, where do you stand on subscription music services? Given that many prominent artists have spoken out against them, what do you think we could do to improve relations with music creators? I guess that's a pretty, that's a pretty controversial topic. Um, and I think that every artist is completely entitled to have an opinion on it. I guess for us, it's more difficult to be very strident about that stuff because without streaming services on the internet probably people wouldn't have heard as much about our band um, and there was a, a gaffe the other day where the songs came off Spotify in Mexico and people got very upset and I'm like oh I'm sorry I go back and fix it but um, I suppose that that's weird in a way because then you're like oh well you don't you don't have my album you can't just go and listen to it but then I guess it's it's just a product of the time to an extent like I didn't grow up in an era where music streaming was that prominent. I remember like getting like one, one, I think I did, I've only ever illegally downloaded one thing. And it was one during the time period we'd have to leave the computer on for like three days. <laughs> um, and I remember having to, to debate with my mom whether we would turn the computer off. And I was like, it's almost there, it's almost there. Um, and it was just cause I couldn't physically get the song. It was like, I think it was like a letters to Cleo cover of Cheap Trick or something that was in a film and I really wanted it, but I couldn't get it. Um, so I guess I don't, can't relate a huge amount to music streaming in that sense, but I guess it's about making, making all that stuff fairer on the artist, because somebody somewhere is making money out of those things, but it's definitely not the people who make the content that's on it. So I guess if there was a way of making those streams, I don't know, somehow feeding the the gain back to the people who have paid and in, paid in time and money to make that because i guess you know at the end of the day someone is trying to make a living off doing that um but i don't know i don't know how to how to fix it i don't know what to do audience question great 
Um, so I have a question about what you see the role of the rest of the online community is in kind of combating misogyny, because I know sometimes people say if you comment defending someone, that brings more attention to it. Do you think that there's a role that everyone on the internet can play in sort of, you know, defending women, defending people in general against these kind of comments? Do you think that brings more attention to it in a positive way, or do you think that hurts the cause by cycling back the focus to those negative comments? Um, I don't know. I guess maybe I'm an antagonistic person, but f for me, I was like the the ignoring it thing. Like when you were a kid and your mom was like, if they're, if they're bullying you, just ignore them. Um, it doesn't, I, I guess I don't think that that theory works here because if you ignore it, then people aren't going to be like, oh, they're ignoring me because I've done something really offensive. They're going to think that you're ignoring them in a kind of, oh, well, fair enough kind of way. Um, and I think if... Yeah, if people can r be respectful of each other, obviously. I'm not saying that you should go and be a horrible, like, awful person in return, because then that's just an eye for an eye. But I think if people can call each other out on those things, then that's that's useful. Um, and also, even in the last, like, year, 18 months or whatever, I've noticed loads more stuff about feminism in mainstream media. And that, I don't know, is that a trend of what people are writing about? Or are they just more willing to talk about it and more people are thinking about it I'm not sure I hope so but um yeah hopefully it won't like disappear again like a kind of feminism is the new black and then it's gone okay. thank you if, yeah. hi um you mentioned that you like feminist stain and Jezebel and I see them sort of as a more palatable or relatable form of feminism especially for like our generation which I think is changing a lot what about them do you really like and how do you think people can sort of pull elements of that into the own, their own content that they're creating online? That's, that's an interesting question. I think um, for me, people like Jessica Valenti are really important voices because she's obviously very intelligent and has studied the academic side of all of this. So she knows, she knows all the theories and she knows all the kind of the texts that you should check out but I think the fact that she's taking that and putting it in a real life situation and the the tone in which she writes in is really relatable and she's talking about things that we've all experienced and I think feminist things are really interesting because they talk about high court rulings on things but then they also talk like have opinion pieces on things that like things that are happening in pop culture or things that are being talked about in the news and I think just kind of having that kind of dialogue is really helpful and it feels like a nice, quite quite a useful community rather than somebody telling you things and being like, you think this. People kind of raise questions and accept comment in return. Um, and I think that's just makes, makes you think about stuff. Um, and I think what, certainly when I was growing up, I didn't really, didn't really have a huge number of friends to, that would be interested in the same kind of things. Um, and I think only within the last few years really have I found as many like-minded women. Um, we kind of make the joke that um, I started like a women's collective in Glasgow to make more friends, <laughs> to make more friends who agreed with me. Um, but I think that, that has been very Im important because it's just a, a thing we have where we run live events and have a radio show and podcasts and things, um, just focusing on women, arts and music and things like that. And for me, that feels like a positive thing to do because otherwise I feel like I'm constantly thinking about the negative things, the things that are, the horrible things that are happening and constantly happen on all levels. But I kind of want to try and change the dialogue in my mind and make it something more positive. And having people to talk to about that is pretty helpful so you don't feel like you're the only one. You're like, oh God, is that, is that fine? Am I overreacting? No, no, it's fine. So yeah, community is key. Do we have any more audience questions? Hello. Um, so uh, I remember a while ago, like a comedian once said that there's a strong power in um, comedy and communication, especially when it comes to tough topics. And it's something along the lines of like, if I make you laugh, then maybe you won't be as threatened or defensive. So sometimes I think of that with music as well. So I wondered if you'd ever um, address these kinds of tough topics in your music, um, or maybe you already have, but your li lyrics are a bit cryptic. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I guess. For, like, when I guess when we write music, for me, like, I just write about 
uh, it's like a kind of personal perspective, whether that's on personal events that have happened to you or a personal perspective on something that's happening externally. Um, but I suppose the lyrics are pretty cryptic, so you probably can't tell from any of that. Um, but yeah, I guess the personal is political to an extent, so the, stu the political is personal and vice versa. So um, there is probably elements of that in the stuff that we're writing about, but I don't think there's necessarily any anthems in the same way there is on like a La Tigre record or something. All right. Uh, well, thank you for coming today. Thank you for having us. Give a lot of We're back, um, yep. and this time you guys get to actually speak, so that's well, I don't nice. Have a so yeah, Ian never gets. We don't let him speak. No. Shall we? Yes, we are a band called Churches. Bye.
guys. <laughs> we are going to play a couple more songs. Um, I feel I'm not um, terribly good at public, <laughs> public speaking, to be honest. It makes me quite worried. Uh, so if there's uh, more vibra vibrato in the voice than is anticipated, it's just left over from that. Me, I'm just looking for someone that will let me go on one of your slides. Yeah, I don't... That's all I want. <laughs> if there's anyone in this room, and there's quite a few, there's more of you than I expected, so surely someone can make it happen for me. Yeah. I've come all the way here, I'm from Scotland. In the name of feminism, let him on the slide. Oh, 
Thanks, guys. Um, we are gonna go. We're gonna play one more song, and then we're gonna go. Um, I need to rehydrate because I've sweated a lot during this experience. <laughs> but it's okay. It's not your fault. It's just psychology. Um, but thank you again for having us. Um, thanks for letting people look us up on on you. <laughs> it's been very helpful to us. Um, uh, one thing is, if oh. you're all here, who's running? Who's the running the internet? <laughs> I'm yeah. kind of a bit worried about that. Yeah, um, but yeah, thank you for having us um, and for letting us come and chat about stuff like that because yeah. um, I think it's really awesome of you guys to do that and make it be less of a marginalised thing. And thanks. Never took your side, never cursed your name. I keep my lips shut tight until you go. Oh, 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 oh. We've come as far as we're ever gonna get until you realize that you should go. Oh, oh, oh. Come in misery where you can't seem as old as your omens and the mother we share. I told the truth I would always be free and keep a prize with me until you go Mother 